check not applicable, and then in the cases where they're required to do a second level review because it's a denial or a, uh, a change in the level of service, uh, then, um, then the second level review is, is required. Uh, the, the, they would complete that, uh, whoever it is, DHCS or the plan, and if it's not applicable because uh, the, the, uh, the person meets the criteria and um, there's no second level review required, then they would check not applicable. So we try to build some flexibility into the signature page that wasn't in the previous version. One other thing that I wanted to mention too is that if you don't have the privilege of having any other information when you are doing this assessment, and you're just walking in and sitting down and um, hopefully the person comes in after you so that you can see how they come into the room and kind of get an idea of how they ambulate or are moved ar move around. Um, you don't want to turn this into a, a three-day or a four-day that you're de deliberating over any kind of condition. If you think something or see something or something is indicated that there's a problem, write it down. But it's not a matter of going back and verifying does this person really have dementia or, you know, did I just imagine that? Um, I need to find records. I need to see this. I need to delve into this or call these people. This assessment should be done with, first of all, the person or, and the caregiver if it's possible or anybody that um, takes care of the person. But if there is no one, you do the best you can with the information that's in front of you. That person um, may or may not be able to communicate with you. Um, that's another indication of, of issues also. If it's a translation problem, um, the facility should, um, if they plan on taking care of the person, should have somebody around that um, is able to speak the language, but they're not mandated to supply an interpreter. But it's always something to think of when you are going into a facility that has a, a, a English as a second language and that somebody is available to help. Um, but you, you do the best with what's in front of you and what you can do at the time. And the, the, once the eligibility has been granted and given to the facility, um, it's their job to really delve deeper into the problems and figure out what kind of plan of care is needed to address that gap that that person has in their life that they need help with so that they are end up in, going to end up in a, a nursing home or the emergency room or some kind of an institution. So with that, I think it's about it. We've got the comments page. We already have covered that a few times. And that's got a whole one page um, uh, at the very end of the document to capture anything else that didn't fit somewhere else. So Jeannie, I think this is probably a good time for us to stop and take questions. And, yeah, and no questions. we have no questions. So either we're doing such a great job showing, uh, giving you the answers as we go, uh, or we've got everybody. Now we do so have one I'm question. So we know the equipment is in them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, if a client is a former ADHD participant and for whatever reason is now referred as a new client, and the center has recent documentation, like such as a progress assessment notes, et cetera. Can we accept such documentation? So uh, I think if I understand the question correctly, we had somebody who was previously at the center, they were discharged for whatever reason or discontinued services, and now they're coming back. The center still has has records. So, so the general instructions are, are saying that the uh, the policy is that, that you're not relying on uh, documentation provided by the CBAS provider um, to, to make determinations. So the independent ass assessment or the independent determination is by definition one that doesn't include the uh, source documents of the CBAS center. So that's the, that's the policy there. I, and I just want to add that when um, a reauthorization comes in, and there is a change in the request of, in service level, such as maybe going from three to four days a week, a face-to-face -face is required. And there is going to be documents um, when they do that face-to-face -face that they will have looked at. Um, the field office personnel or the managed care plan will have looked at um, to go ahead and do that face-to-face -face in for that up in services. So there are instances where there will be level of service changes yeah. looked at for a re yeah, for level of service changes. But for the initial, um, and if somebody is coming from a different facility, that to us is considered an initial 
um, visit, and we need to assess them and see uh, what what they are at that point in time because these people, some of them change very quickly, some of them don't change that quickly, but we still want to assess them. Do you need anything else? We have another question. Um, on a previous webinar, it was stated that the health plan has to do another face-to-face -face for all changes to days per week, increase or decrease. Is that accurate? So my understanding is, is that, the, that the requirements for the face-to-face uh, -face are whenever there's a level of service change where the adjudication level of service is going down, right, or if it's a new person uh, who's coming into the program. So um, for the plans, as Debbie has, has indicated, um, there are, or for, the, for DHCS, there are some slightly different processes that, uh, that they, will, uh, they will do with regards to uh, those changes up or down, or a transfer from one center to another. And uh, in the case of the plans, they have discretion, and our understanding is, again, we're not managed care experts, Debbie and I, but our understanding is, is that there are, uh, there's a lot of cooperation that goes on among the plans um, with individuals moving from one center to another, and one plan accepting another plan's face-to-face uh, -face determination, et cetera. So the fee-for-service side of the house does things slightly differently, but, um, but the requirements for when the face-to-face -face take place are actually in the slides at the beginning of the presentation, um, and those are the requirements uh, of the settlement, that it's for new, uh, new participants and, and service uh, level uh, changes where you adjudicate service levels down. Okay, any other questions? Another question, if the face-to-face -face is completed and the member changes insurance within one to two weeks of the face-to-face, -face, can you use the face-to-face -face from the other managed care plans review? The other managed care organizations review, and and again we can we can make sure that we get clarification on this and get it as you know something from the managed care folks on a plan call or something. But my understanding is is that there's there's a great deal of uh, cooperation that has been going on among the plans with sharing uh, determination uh, uh, a, a, as well as um, uh, adjudicated service levels. So um, that's I think at the discretion of the plan to to, to enter into those kind of cooperative arrangements. And she's thinking that they, they were staying at the same center, but changing health plans. And changing but, plans. Yeah. yeah. Again, that's, a, that's a, at, the, at the discretion of the, of the plans with their members and how they work that. Okay. And one other question was, um, should we start using the new CEVT form now or wait until April 1st? So it should, it should start on April 1. That's when everybody's beginning to use the, the, the form at DHCS and with the plan. So April 1 and beyond. And that's all the questions we have right now. All right, then we will move on through uh, through the rest of our presentation. And if you have any questions that take us back, that's okay. We'll bring them, uh, bring the form back up, and we'll address your questions as they pop up. Um, so again, one of the main uh, things I think that, that we tried to do with the version 2.0 uh, that we got a lot of feedback on um, was that we needed to build in. Those, um, those criteria for, for participation to make it very clear and user friendly to capture the most, uh, the most important um, uh, sets of information in, in that, uh, that evaluation and then clearly document the outcome. So I think that's what, that's what this new organization of the forum was designed um, to do and we hope that it's done that. Um, so the websites, um, again, if you want to you grab a copy of the, the slides uh, or the um, the form, the instructions, uh, the DHCS website, if you're not already aware of it, and then the Department of Aging, and I, and I know the forms are posted on ours if we haven't got them up on DHCS yet. And we are, just in case somebody's going to ask a question, we are working on getting the electronic version of the form um, together for the PDF form fill. So we're doing that as well. So we'll get that posted when it's done. Okay, so uh, at the top of the top of the presentation, I mentioned that we have um, some some slides in here that uh, provide references for you. 
uh, for eligibility categories and medical necessity. Again, most of that information that you need to know for making the determination is now built into the new tool, which you're very happy to have, and that, that means that um, you don't have to have uh, the Welfare and Institutions Code in your back pocket or the Title 22 requirements, et cetera, or the settlement requirements or the waiver requirements. They're not all you know, in five different places. They're in that tool. But for your reference, uh, we've provided them in these slides so that if you want to delve deeper and look at the, the exact uh, wording of things, uh, the Welfare and Institutions Code on that first bullet, 14525, is the eligibility criteria. Uh, that's the old ADHC eligibility criteria, but they apply to CVAS. 14526.1 is the medical necessity criteria. 14550 and 50.5 are the uh, core and required services. So those uh, explain what's necessary uh, on a daily basis and then what all those additional services are. So those are your references there. The Darling versus Douglas Settlement Agreement that created the CBAS program also has those, uh, the new criteria, uh, those categories one through five. Um, so more detail there. Uh, again, those are available on the DHCS and CBA websites if you want to take a look at them. If you're new to this effort and you haven't heard enough about it already, uh, you can at least look those up for yourself. The California Bridge to Reform uh, Demonstration Waiver, the Special Terms and Conditions, pages 44 through 56 are the pages that are addressed CVAS, and so there's more information about the program there, again, on the websites. Um, there's a matrix here um, that, that we put in a reference for. If you click on that link in your slides, uh, or, or key it in where it will take